Well, it continues to be a, a great joy to minister the Word of God to you all and uh, to gather as an assembled uh, people of God to, to worship Him in spirit and truth. And really that is the purpose. We are seeing more and more just the essential nature of our gathering, how important it is for us to, to see one another, to be with one another, to sing together, pray together, study the Word of God together, and just what a tremendous joy it is. We return this morning to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. We are particularly looking at the issue of prayer in the Kingdom of God. This sermon preached by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is directed toward His disciples, those whom He will redeem and save by His sacrificial death on the cross. But this sermon covers a multitude of issues from uh, issues of sin and the law, blessing, giving, devotion, anxiety, covers quite a large panoply of topics as we've seen over the last several months. Really doctrinal truths to address a wide variety of needs. And as the sermon really winds down to its final conclusion, Jesus brings the listeners to one final place. He addresses the issue of prayer, but not just prayer. Rather, he deals with the tender relationship that exists between the Heavenly Father and His children. And so with that, turn with me, if you haven't already, to Matthew chapter 7 in your copy of Scripture. Now the end of chapter 7 lands with a bang. Essentially, Jesus separates true versus false believers. And we're going to spend probably four weeks looking at those verses, uh, just kind of looking ahead at those verses. They are... Uh, power packed, and uh, I, I tremble uh, to, to bring you those words, but certainly uh, they are beneficial to us. But just prior to his final conclusion, in verses 7 through 12, he addresses believe, his believing audience, those who belong to God, he addresses his children. And he offers up life giving words to those who are concerned about God's provision for them. If you remember in your mind back to uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, Jesus addresses the issue of anxiety. And we spent several weeks talking about fear and anxiety and worry. And he really lands by encouraging the listener to trust God, to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And now he's going to tell those people, those very same people, to pray to God for the things that they need. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, admittedly, this is one of, really, one of the more popular texts of Scripture. And frankly, I fear that it's popular for all the wrong reasons. Many circles use this verse, this, this uh, threefold entreaty, ask, seek, knock, is sort of a religious magical formula for trying to get God to do what you want Him to do. The prosperity gospel preachers use this to tell people that if all they have to do is ask God for things, and He is obliged to give them to them. I've heard more sermons than I want to hear about this very thing, that really giving and your tithing and your you know, measure of faith is God's insurance policy that He has to bless you in the ways that you demand. And they use this as a proof text. But this fundamentally under misunderstands both the context of the passage and the underlying truth being taught. So let's examine Jesus' teaching here. And I want to really see that He has a, a pretty deliberate argument for what He's saying in this text. Verse 7, if you look at your Bible, verse 7 becomes the key command. The key command. Verse 8 really becomes the result of following the command. Verses 9 and 10 are an argument from lesser to greater. We'll talk about that. And then verse 11 is the ultimate truth for us to learn. But let's look at this again. Look at verse 7 again. 
Verse 7, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. So three main verbs here are ask, seek, and knock. The first verb, ask, in the Greek is eteo. It literally means to make a request. Now it's immediately clear from the context that this is, uh, this is an asking the cosmos. You're not just you know, pr praying prayers into thin air and hoping that the universe is going to respond to you. It's not speaking things into existence. We know from the context, the entire sermon, this is asking of the Lord. And so all this jargon, all this garbage that's in New Age philosophy about sort of speaking things into existence and you know, the power of the secret and asking the universe to give you things that you want, uh, that is not what Jesus is talking about here. This is not a generic ask anywhere and it will be given to you. This is specifically to the Lord. And he, said, he promises here, if you ask, it will be given to you. In other words, your request will be granted. And next he adds seek, zeteo in the Greek. It really means to search after, to inquire into. And then he, he includes with that as well, seek and you will find. And the question is, well, what does this seeking and finding pertain to? Well, in the immediate context at this point, we don't yet know, but we're going to examine this because we want to get why this is important. And then third, he says, knock, which literally means to strike, like you're knocking on a door. He says to the listener, he assures them, knock and it will be opened to you. Again, somewhat mysterious by itself. We don't yet know what this is. But Jesus affirms these three commands in verse 8, promising, he says, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. So in these verses, Jesus seems to be promising that whatever you request, uh, that will be granted to you. It seems to be a general maxim, a general maxim. If you read the book of Proverbs, it's full of maxims like that, sort of a promise and a, a desire to result. But when we look a little bit further, we can see that it's not really that simple. The Bible teachers generally agree that Jesus is not just giving three distinct commands. He's not saying ask and, and then seek and then knock. It's not that. Rather, it's expressing one overall big command He's expressing it three different ways. So there's really one thing that Jesus is saying, but it's being expressed asking, seeking, and knocking. What Jesus is referring to here is entreating the Lord through earnest prayer. Entreating the Lord through earnest prayer. And really what we see in this triad is a progression of intensity. And you see it pretty clearly, asking, seeking, knocking. First you see really just a prayer of petition. You're just asking God. You go to God and you say, Lord, I would like whatever it would be. Lord, please give me this, or please bless me with this. It's just a simple ask. It's a prayer of petition. And then we see sort of the persistent prayer of a person that's wanting the answer. It's seeking. It's going after. So it's a step farther. And finally, we have in this progression a person walking right up to the gate of heaven and knocking on the door. And so it is a progression of intensity in the prayer. But this is more than just a passive act of shooting up a prayer or two when you need something. This is the persistent effort of a person who is seeking the Lord. I want to illustrate this with something that Jesus says elsewhere. Go to Luke chapter 18 in your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So go to Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 18. Luke 18 really places us in the middle of a heavy teaching section in Luke. We read about the prodigal son in Luke 15, followed by Jesus' teaching on wealth in chapter 16. Chapter 17 focuses on really issues of forgiveness and service and gratitude, as well as a discourse on the actual kingdom, at which point Jesus starts chapter 18 by teaching on prayer. And he says so as much. Look at uh, Luke chapter 18. This is, the, this is Jesus speaking here. Now he was telling them a parable to show them at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. And there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. 
Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now in this parable, Jesus is telling of the exchange between this widow and this unrighteous judge. Now we see here, just an example, this judge does not fear God, so he's not a believer, he doesn't care about God. He doesn't respect man, he's kind of a scoundrel, he's unrighteous. In other words, he's really just a terrible judge. But this widow is seeking a fair ruling from him, which he finally grants to her because he's sick of dealing with her. She's a pest and he doesn't want to deal with her anymore, and so he decides to just give her the ruling that she wants. The idea is that even an unrighteous judge will eventually grant the request if he's pestered. Now this is an extreme example. Jesus is using this really hyperbolically. He goes on further, Jesus says, How much more then will God, who is a righteous judge, if an unrighteous judge will eventually cave to a person who keeps on asking, how much more will a righteous judge grant to those who ask him? And the answer is, he will. He will. He will answer. And again, the point from verse 1, look back at verse 1 here in chapter 18. The point is that we should persist in prayer, he's saying. Persist. And then he adds, and not lose heart. Pray and don't lose heart, believers. Go back to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Here again, Jesus seems to have this kind of persistence in his mind uh, in, in the issues of prayer here, he reassures that God will answer those who ask and seek and knock. But again, we need to press a little bit further here. Is this really an indiscriminate blank check from God? What is this saying? Is, this so, is he some sort of cosmic genie? Because again, you read it very plainly and it says, well, yeah, I guess I can just ask for whatever I want. I, you know, I'm going to ask for a billion dollars. Why not? If he's given out free stuff, why not? Is that what the Bible teaches about the nature of God and His uh, answers to prayer? Well, the Bible says no. I want to keep on working through this here with you. We need to see that the Bible gives us some ground rules, some ground rules for how we are to understand this sentiment. I want to give you three. There's certainly more that can be said, but I want to give you at least three to help us frame our thinking around these verses. The first ground rule is this. This command, this sentiment, only applies to believers. This only applies to believers. Over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount, we read that these things are between us and our Heavenly Father. Over and over again, many, many times, we see uh, the sentiments of, you know, this, 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 this action, and your Heavenly Father who sees you will do such and such a thing. So, all of this is said in the context of us as believers and our Heavenly Father. Uh, this only ha happens in the context of a saving relationship. If you're in a saving relationship with God, then this is the kind of relationship that you have. These commands are for you. If you don't know God, then you cannot count on Him as your Heavenly Father. And we'll talk about that in, more in a second. In fact, prior to salvation, Romans 5.10 tells us that apart from our relationship with God through Christ, apart from a saving relationship with God, that we were actually God's enemies. I think sometimes people think that there is neutral ground here, that if I'm not a Christian, if I don't belong to God, if I'm not a believer, that, you know, we kind of have this understanding. You know, I don't really want to go to church or read my Bible. I don't really trust Him for things. Uh, you know, I just kind of go about my business and I leave Him alone. He leaves me alone. It's sort of a neutral ground. That's not what the Bible says about relationships with God. It says that we are His enemies if we are not in Christ, not his friends, not his children. But in salvation, in salvation, God adopts us as his own. The doctrine of adoption is a beautiful doctrine. Study that out heartily, believers. Doctrine of adoption, in that he takes us on and brings us into his own, his kingdom, wraps his arms around us, and he becomes our heavenly father. We get to call him dad. That's one privilege of adoption is communion with the triune God. And in that relationship, we get to pray to him. We get to ask him for things. We get to make requests. And the Bible teaches that he hears. But John 9.31 affirms that God does not hear the prayer of sinners. And while there may be 
isolated instances where God interacts with unbelievers. You see examples in the Bible, really, uh, when they call out to him. Just a couple of examples. The people of Nineveh uh, in Jonah cry out to God in repentance. Uh, Hagar in Genesis 21. Ahab in 1 Kings 21. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So there are isolated incidents where God is interacting and dealing with a certain person for something. But as a general principle, Unbelievers are not put in a position where they are free to make requests to God. If, if you're not in Christ, God is not your genie. You can't just make demands of God as if he's obliged to respond to you. On what basis would he want to respond when the Bible says that we are his enemies apart from Christ? But Jesus tells his disciples, all who are listening in the audience, that if they ask of God, he, as their heavenly father, will hear them. Second ground rule, second ground rule, you must ask with the right motive. Turn to James chapter 4, James chapter 4. James really, if you study the epistle of James, he holds nothing back. I mean, I love James because he's so uh, tenacious, but I'll tell you, you read James, you feel like you got beat up for a couple of minutes there. But really, some have regarded James to be a practical commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And there are at least more than a dozen, if not maybe 18 or 20, allusions from the Sermon on the Mount in the Epistle of James. And so James really has this sermon in his mind, it seems, as he's teaching uh, the church. However, he hits various issues surrounding what happens if Jesus is not obeyed. Several portions of James are flat out rebukes to the church for wrong action and behavior. In the beginning of chapter 4, though, he points out the problem of a sinful, fleshly impulse that destroys everything we set out to do. Look at James chapter 4. He says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? He says, You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility but toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We're going to spend a couple weeks actually talking about this very same thing. But for now, the question is posed, why does God not answer prayer? What are the conditions surrounding a time when God would not respond and not answer prayer in the way that you want? Well, the answer is when the prayer is selfish or wicked or the motive is wrong. Jesus says, ask and it will be given. Seek, you'll find. Knock, it'll be open. But if you seek the Lord for the purpose of your own glory and not His... Don't expect that he's going to give you what you ask for. And I would even add this. If he does give you what you selfishly ask for, be very afraid because that thing could end up being your undoing. Sometimes a judgment of God is giving you what you ask for. I countered a grace in my own life, a mercy in my own life that God has not given me some of the things I've asked for. So asking for wrong motives. If you ask for selfish motives, sinful motives, wrong motives, God is not obliged to answer you. But really a third ground rule. I want to go one more place here. Go to 1 John. Keep on going down in your Bible into the New Testament. 1 John chapter 3. Again, we're continuing to refine the parameters of this command. The kinds of prayers that God responds to are those of believers those which are done with the right motive. And number three, third ground rule, their prayers of obedience for His glory and according to His will. This is key. First John, I'm just going to look at one verse here. First John 3.22. Sometimes I just quote verses for you, but I wanted you to look at this with your own eyes. First John 3.22, he says, Whatever we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments, and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. 
And so then he continues, this is the commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. And so a big theme in John is certainly loving others but obeying God, obeying God in the context of this saving relationship. But he ties these things together. Asking and receiving from God, he connects that. He says the reason that we ask and receive, he says, is because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him. We're obedient to God and he responds. We, we seek his glory and he responds. When you're praying only for yourself to spend things on yourself, whatever that may be, again, you're not seeking God's glory. We as believers need to seek God's glory. Jesus says the exact same thing really in Matthew 7, 7, Matthew 21, 22, John 14, 13. Whatever we ask, we receive from him. We have to ask with the right motive though. And he qualifies first because God answers when we keep his commands, we obey. And we do the things that are pleasing in his sight, we glorify God. And I would even add to this, even if you were to flip one more page over to chapter 5, verse 14. Again, it's all here for us. Chapter 5, verse 14, John notes again, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything, if we ask anything, here it is, according to His will, He hears us. If we ask according to His will, He hears us. We ask of Him, we seek Him, we knock on the door, and if our prayers are not selfish for bad motives, and if we answer, uh, if we ask according to, uh, or if He answers according to His will, that's the, the kind of prayer that we're going to have from Him. Now, at first, this seems like a lot of qualifiers. Maybe at the beginning of the sermon you're thinking, well, gee whiz, Nate, that looked really good at the beginning, and now there's just all these different ground rules. Then what am I supposed to pray for? But let me just challenge you even again if you're thinking that way. Would you want God to answer all your selfish prayers? Think about the things that in your flesh, at your worst possible moment in the course of your day, I really want this, or I really want that, or I don't want this, or don't want that. Selfishly, sinfully, would you want God in right mind to answer you according to your selfish prayers, your sinful prayers? I think the answer for most of us, all of us, should be no. No. Second question, would you want God to answer your requests that goes against His will? If you were to ask God for something, God, I know this is probably not what you're, at, what you're telling me to do here. I know Scripture says this, but I want you to do this. If He answers according to, against His will, do you want that? And I would tremble and say, absolutely not. I would not want God to violate His own will to give me what I want. And again, that's what New Age philosophy advocates for. Children of God, believers, Christians, we all say, no, I want God to give me the things that are according to his will, that are for his glory, done because I've been obedient to him. Those are the prayers I want answered if I'm honest. We want God to be glorified through what we ask for, right? I mean, as a, as a Christian, as a person who's been born again and had your heart changed and, and raptured into the, the presence of God, I want Him to be glorified. Woe to me if I seek my own glory. That's so fleeting. It's so fallen. Woe to the person who desires to make God their genie. Command Him as their slave. No, children of God, we love our Heavenly Father. We love Him and want Him to be glorified. And so, why then does Jesus say what He says? Go back to Matthew 7. Why does Jesus say this? Now, again, to be sure, Jesus knows He's telling believers to ask. He's talking to His sheep. Surely He knows that God will not respond to their sinful and selfish prayers. He knows this. And of course, he knows that God is only going to answer according to his will. And so what is the purpose then, if there's all these ground rules that are set out in Scripture, what is the purpose then of this exhortation? Simply put, Jesus wants his followers to trust the Lord God. He wants us to trust him. Remember, he already addressed the believer who is anxious and fearful that God is not going to provide for their basic needs. He's already addressed that. Because we get so worried 
And I'll tell you, the more the culture progresses or digresses, the more that we see people are just addicted to fear and worry. Every day that goes on, even now, more anxious, more worried, more fearful. What's going to happen? And we worry, God, are you going to provide for us right now? Are you going to take care of us? Let me tell you this. I'm just going to pause for a second. If you're a child of the Most High God, if your family belongs to Him, we talked about this last week in Joshua. My brother Ken helped me preach that sermon. I'm appreciative. But t toward the end of that, the command, Joshua 24, 14, when Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If that's you, if you're, st and now I'm going to talk to, to husbands, to men here. If you're making that declaration, if you're saying, no, I'm going to lead my family in godliness. Now, again, they're not obliged to follow if they're not born again. But I'll tell you, taking a stand, leading your family, leading your wife, leading your children in godliness. Plant your flag and say, no, my family belongs to God. We submit to him. We obey him. If, if you belong to God, do you think he's going to take care of you? Is he going to provide for you? Is he going to meet your needs? Are things going to be difficult? You're promised suffering. Jesus says, you're going to have trouble in this life, but take heart. I've overcome the world. And so if Jesus is promising that to those who love him and who follow him, and you belong to him, then your future, your destiny, whatever it is in this life, is secure in him. And if we're martyred for the faith, glory to God. Now, I don't have a death wish, but many believers have been killed for their faith. Jesus is instructing us to trust the Lord God. We see this back in Matthew 6, 33. He even says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. All these things you're concerned about will be added to you. But the command is seek God, chase God, go after God first. Don't turn to the world first. Don't turn to the news first. Don't get the popular opinion first. Seek God first. And all this other stuff will be added to you. That's what he's saying. He's already told them to seek the Lord. And he knows that we're often so stubborn and faithless to do it. But this prayer, and prayer in general, prayer is an exercise of faith. People ask all the time, well, if God is sovereign, and God already knows what he's going to do, and he's already made a way for that, then why do I pray? You pray as an obedience. You pray as an act of faith. You pray to align your will with his. When you don't talk to him, how do you think he wants to respond to that? I, be, I believe in God. I'm just not going to talk to him for a while. Believers don't do that. We seek our Heavenly Father. One practical way we demonstrate our faith is by bringing our requests to God. People always ask all the time, well, how, how do I have faith? I had one person ask me, I said, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. They said, how? And I was walking through different ways to do that. How? And the question kept on persisting over and over and over again. Well, this is one practical way to do it. What does it mean to trust in God? You take everything in your life that you're concerned about, all your thoughts, all your intentions, all your fears, all your doubts, whatever you have, your hope for the future, you take all of that, ball it up, and you give it to him and you say, Lord, all of my heart is yours. The things I'm worried about, the things I'm hopeful for, whatever it is, I trust you with the future. That's one way. Bringing your request before God. Trusting God that he can and will meet our needs. He's more than able. More than able. But again, we struggle to obey this. We think our life is in our hands. I love what John Calvin says. He says that it is certain that all who allege that they are not to come to God directly. So he's arguing for the negative. All who say that they do, are not to come to God directly are not only rebellious and disobedient, but also convicted of unbelief in as much as they distrust the promises. The reason we don't bring our request before God is because somewhere in the back of our mind, we don't think he's going to pull through for us. He's not going to hear. He's not going to answer. He can't do anything about my situation. That's blasphemy. That's wrong. The root of prayerlessness is unbelief. How so? Again, because you're either convinced that he's not listening or he won't respond. But Jesus attacks that. He attacks that. Look at this. 
He's going to use what's called an a fortiori argument. It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. We've seen this many, many times in Scripture. It's a very popular way, uh, a rhetorical argument here. Look at verses 9 and 10. Again, he's, this is a context of asking God, making a request to God. He says, so What man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? Now, these are two rhetorical statements that are meant to be complementary to one another. And look, just look at them with me. The first one, and I want you to just think about this for a second, what this means. This is envisioning a son who's hungry, coming to his father and asking for a loaf of bread. My children are at the age where that's all they do is ask for food. My grocery bill is going through the roof right now. But it's good. What parent, what father, when their child comes to them and says, Dad, I'm hungry, what parent is going to say, here, chew on this rock for a few minutes? I mean, would you really do that? He says, will a father give him a stone for bread? Is the father going to starve his child and placate them and abuse them by giving them something that's not edible? And the crowd in front of Jesus would have said, no! Because Jesus is asking these questions to this crowd, to the rhetorical crowd. Would, would a father give his son a stone? They would have said, no, of course not. Then he elaborates, look at verse 10. Or if he asks for a fish, will he not give him a snake? Is he going to give him a snake too? And, and they would have said, no, of course not. And notice here the progression. Instead of being an inedible rock, his father is giving him a snake. You could technically eat a snake, right? I mean, that's... It's not as good as a fish or a piece of bread, but you could technically survive if you ate a snake. But that's not what he says. He's not going to give his son a subpar meal. He's going to give him a piece of fish. I mean, this is, this is very simple, isn't it, folks? It's very logical. Would a loving father give, him, give his child something that is detestable to eat? The answer from the crowd is no. No! That's the most basic thing. And now, and even people who do do that, who are nasty and mean to their children, who abuse their children, we would rightly say, you're out of your mind. We report people who do that, right? And so if that's true, look at verse 11. Here's the payoff. Jesus says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, here comes the lesser to the greater. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? This goes off like a bomb to the crowd. Again, lesser to greater. Jesus uses this word, poneros, uh, bad or evil or wicked. He's saying, you people, all of you are sinners. All of you are sinners. Now, He's not saying they're utterly wicked, that they're totally incapable of doing anything good. That's not the argument here. But what He's saying is that, that these people... Are all of us are sinful people. We're not perfect. We're not totally righteous. But yet, we being sinful people with besetting sins and all kinds of indwelling sin, those of us who are unrighteous, which is every single person on the planet, even we would not feed our kids snakes and rocks. If that's the case... And we sinners know how to give our kids good gifts. How much more? How much more? Will our holy, righteous, merciful, loving, generous, benevolent, sovereign God give good gifts to His children who ask them? Do you see what He's doing? We worry that God is not going to answer, He's not going to provide for us, but yet we accuse him of doing something less than even we would do for our own children. We, we remove him from the throne and we kick him to the curb. And we say, you're a terrible dad. That's wrong, my friends. It's wrong. Because even we who are sinful, even we love our children. And we wrap our children in our arms. And we hug them and we kiss them. We provide for them. We go without for them. We would even die for them. And is that, is that not what the Father has done for us? He's given Himself to us in Jesus, who came and gave His life for His children? 
Is he not a good God? Is he not a benevolent God? A righteous God? A generous God? And we insult him when we don't think that he's going to answer according to his will. We think we're all alone here? Do you think that? Do you believe that? No. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Out of the mouth of children. How much more? And the answer is infinitely more. Infinitely more. That's why Paul breaks out in unfettered praise in Ephesians 3.20. He says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul can't stop himself from praising God. He sees the goodness of God and the righteousness of God and the benevolence of God, and he just can't stop. He has to restrain himself from praising God in his letters. God wants us to ask Him. He wants us to seek Him. He wants us to trust Him. And the Bible teaches that we have access to God, the God of creation, who, according to Ephesians 1.3, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Furthermore, He has blessed us with the riches of His grace. And the Bible actually says, according to the riches of His grace. Well, how do you do that? Well, if God is rich beyond all comparison. And he gives according to that measure. And the answer is infinitely able. God can do anything he desires to do. He can bless materially for many of us, especially in our country. We have abundant riches. Compared to most countries in the world, we're extremely wealthy. God is able to bless materially. He can bless you spiritually. He can heal, He can deliver, He can bring you joy, strength, peace. He rescues people, He redeems them. He changes people from the inside out. I mean, can you just fathom for a second, I think we take it for granted as believers, what it takes to change a person from the inside out, where their heart changes, they become a different person from the inside. They look the same on the outside but they become different from the inside out. It's a remarkable thing. It's an exertion of His supreme power. And He has offered salvation through the sacrificial death and resurrection of Christ. And all who would turn from their sins and trust in Jesus would be saved. He saves, and then He adopts us as His own children. And now we are being afforded the blessing of seeking and knowing Him. There's one final verse I want to look at today, and that is verse 12. Verse 12. And really, this is a, a summary verse in Matthew chapter 7. We've only seen it as a summary verse for the last section, but, uh, or I should say, some have seen it only as a summary for the last section, but in truth, it serves to summarize all of the text from chapter 5, verse 17 to now. Jesus declares that he did not come to abolish the law of the prophets, but to fulfill them. And then starting in chapter 5, verse 21, he begins to move down all of these implications of the law as it applies to the heart of the believer, all the way to chapter 7, verse 11, which we were just in. And it applies again to law and the life and the conscience. And he covers so many different topics as we've seen over the last couple of months. But here he's going to sum up everything. He's going to sum up everything. Every instance of thought, action, deed toward another person. In the end of this sermon, he's going to focus on individual stance before God. And we're going to focus on that in the coming weeks here. So the end of the sermon is our relationship to God. But here, we're going to see that there is our relationship to other people. What is the summary of all of God's commands with regards to other people? Look at verse 12. He says, In everything, therefore, Treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Some have called this the golden rule. In fact, it's been called that as early as the third century. Interestingly enough, though, at least earthly speaking, this sentiment did not originate with Jesus. Versions of this uh, sentiment have been made by countless persons throughout world history. 
Most notably, Rabbi Hillel, around 20 AD, is noted to have been asked to summarize the law of God. And he responded, what is hateful to do, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law, all the rest is commentary. Again, many leaders have uttered similar sentiments, but all of them are designed to highlight the prohibitive nature of law. Essentially, the, the sentiment is don't do the wrong thing. That's the essence of the law, is to restrain evil. But Jesus is the first person in recorded history to utter the sentiment in the positive. Treat people the same way that you want them to treat you. Or another alternative is do to others what you would have them do unto you. Essentially, it's a command to do good. But he adds that this is the law and the prophets. In other, in other words, this summarizes the ethical commands of the whole Bible. Paul makes the same argument in Romans 13, 8. He says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Or even I like what Philippians 2, 4 says, Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is a call to love other people, to regard other people, to do good to other people. If you love others, you're not going to sin against them. Now, this is important. Contrary to the belief of the world, doing good is not the gospel. Doing good is not the gospel. You're not saved by your good deeds. Now, again, in, in ages past, nowadays, popular culture uses Matthew 25 as kind of their Christianese theme chapter. It used to be this one probably 50, 100 years ago, it was, it was this verse, was kind of the popular culture, popular Christianity's theme verse. And the idea is if you just be a good person, that's good enough. That's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Christ has come and died to pay for the for sins of those who have sinned against Him. But the, here, the, the key here is this is an ethic for those who have been saved by Christ through the gospel. And the question is asked then, it seems like there's been a shift in the text, doesn't there? Does this verse have any connection to the previous few verses? And the, the answer is emphatically yes. If God treats us like children and loves us and does good to us and provides for us, that is meant to strengthen our faith in God and drive us to Him. But if that's true, then surely we can manifest that to other people as well. There's a connection between our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. Our union together as believers is rooted in our union with God in Christ Jesus. And so this vertical relationship has implications horizontally. If God has treated us so well and has promised to treat us so well, then we should also love others and do good to them. And again, what is the greatest, God, the greatest good that God has ever done? He has given us His Son for our salvation. Let us never forget the goodness of God. And when you pray, when you pray, beloved, remember His goodness, remember His kindness, and remember this verse that you will ask, you will seek, and you will knock. He is your Father if you're in Christ. And he will answer your prayers according to his will. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is just be patient. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning in prayer. Our text is all about seeking you and knocking and asking of you. And so, Father, in that spirit, we do that here even now. Father, I, I earnestly seek you on behalf of your people uh, that you would help us, Lord, even today. Uh, Father, it seems as though there are so many problems outside in the world, but Lord, there are just as many, if not more, things inside of us that are quicker to ruin us, Lord. And so I pray that you would help, help your people to get serious about our walk with you and not to be afraid, not to fear, but rather to turn to you. In this time, turn to you and trust you, ask you and seek after you and even knock, knowing that you will hear us and answer in the way that glorifies you the most. 
Lord, I pray that in this whole time that we are here, in this world and in this, in, even in this season, that we would be a people to grow closer to you. We would run, out, run away from the things of the world and chase hard after you, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, for all your people, weighed down with worries and fears and concerns, we would find our source of hope and solace in you alone. Thank you for creating this, this relationship, this pathway in Christ, that because of Jesus Christ giving himself as a ransom, as a payment for sin on the cross, our sin debts can be paid for and forgiven, and we can be restored to you not as enemies, but as friends, as children, that our relationship with you is rooted in the sacrifice of Christ. Thank you, God, for this gospel. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.